We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. China is again trying to coerce and intimidate Taiwan with military exercises that are encircling the island, challenging Taiwanese airspace and launching missiles from the mainland toward Taiwan. She and the CCP are justifying these exercises as an appropriate response to Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit during a congressional delegation to East Asia. And to her credit, Speaker Pelosi was not dissuaded from visiting Taiwan, even though China and the Biden administration opposed the visit. The Chinese warned prior to her visit that the U.S. will pay the price if Pelosi visits and have since ended bilateral coordination on issues such as climate change, oh no, and military deconfliction. With such a response to a mere visit, I wanted to bring in someone who could inform us on why Taiwan matters, what is the situation with Taiwan, and how we got there and where it's going. So joining us today is Dan Blumenthal, Senior Fellow and Director of Asian Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He uh, previously served at as a senior director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the Department of Defense between 2006 and 2012. He was a commissioner on the U.S.-China Economic Security Review Commission, and he's the author of The China Nightmare, The Grand Ambitions of a Dying State. Uh, Dan, thanks for being on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So um, I want to start with some very basics, I think, because everybody knows that China and Taiwan don't like each other. I think most Americans could answer that simple question. I doubt most Americans could find Taiwan on a map, but they know it's an island just off the coast of China. I think they, I think they know that much. Um, but I don't, including myself. I mean, I kind of just read up on it um, recently. You know, really, what the history is of of Taiwan? I mean, they 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 speak Chinese. Um, that's about all most people know. And and is that where the similarities end between Taiwan and China? What is the history, the relevant history that people need to know to, to sort of just at least frame this situation? Yeah, sure. So it's it's not just speaking Chinese. I mean, they it's it's like, uh, you know, if 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 China was more reasonable, you could say it would be sort of like a commonwealth, a common culture, uh, descendants uh, like the UK, Canada, Australia, the United States, uh, you know, the Anglosphere, if you will, Taiwan mm-hmm. and China. Do share a past and do share um, a common culture and a common language. That's diverged quite a bit in the last 20, 25 years because Taiwan's become a liberal democracy and, and China still rule, ruled as a tyranny under the Chinese Communist uh, Party. So uh, political culture has diverged quite a bit. But there is, you know, there the people on Taiwan uh, made their way made their way from China to Taiwan over the course of the last 400 years or so. And, and so there is, there's certainly a cultural link. Well, well, let's go into more detail than that though. I mean, <laughs> why are they different countries? Why, 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 um, you know, when was the split? When were they technically unified? Is there a colonial history here that, that, that is relevant? I mean, we don't have to go to the deep boring details, but you know, as far as, as relevant history, at least in the last century, let's say. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, so the the problem, if you will, began. Um, the Japanese actually occupied Taiwan. Um, they fought a war with with China at the time, not the People's Republic of China, the the last Chinese dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, before the mm-hmm. Qing Dynasty collapsed. Actually, the Japanese war against China, the China Sino Japanese War in 1895, was part of the reason the last dynasty collapsed. Uh, which is why, by the way, contemporary China is so careful about getting into Wars they can't win now, but uh, the Japanese occupied it, uh, Taiwan, from 1895 to 1945. Uh, you'll find among a generation of Taiwanese dying out but still living that Japanese is their first language, and actually, unlike a lot of countries that were occupied by Japan, they view the Japanese occupation somewhat uh, less critically. Uh, it industrialized Taiwan. If you go to Taiwan, you see the Japanese architecture. A lot of influence, Japanese food, uh, Japanese language. Um, but then um, after World War II, you know, a lot of people probably don't know this, but the U.S. fought along, you know, fought alongside China um, against the Japanese. And after the um, Japanese surrendered, um, the status of Taiwan wasn't wasn't clear in 1945. Yeah. My grandpa still- was uh, stationed in China, actually, during right? World War II. Yeah, as a as, Marine um, or uh, Army no, officer. 
army. I mean, he was uh, basically an army air crewman, uh, the Flying Tigers. Still have his uniform. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, really important history there. Flying Tigers. They're they're still beloved in Taiwan for what they did. Um, oh. Yeah, and and well known uh, flying really? the, the Himalayas. Yeah. So um, anyway, it, there was a civil war in China. The Chinese Communist Party was was fighting against the so-called nationalists, the KMT. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the KMT retreated to Taiwan and took it over. There was a native population there. Hmm. Uh, the KMT took it over and essentially said, uh, we will be fighting from here to take over. So the real competition was between the KMT and the CCP over who ruled all of China. The KMT claimed we are one China. The CCP claimed we are one China. The competition was over. Was it Beijing or was it Taipei? We in the United States didn't take a position until um, the Korean War, actually, in 1950. Um, and because the Chinese Communist Party jo joined in the Korean War and, and uh, repelled, uh, repelled the Americans from, um, you know, from, from parts of Korea, parts of northern Korea, we actually decided we were going to have a treaty with Taiwan and recognize Taiwan because of the dangers of, of the CCP. So at that time we recognized Taiwan, we had a treaty with Taiwan. We, um, we actually said Taiwan was the sole representative of, of all of China, um, you know, and, and that was part of the Cold War history. Uh, fast forward to uh, 1972, President Richard Nixon decides uh, famously that it's time to reverse that, that we need uh, uh, China uh, on our side against the Soviet Union. The, the mainland China on our side, 1972 to 1979, part of the negotiation for what we call the normalization of U.S.-China relations uh, was to de-recognize Taiwan, was to uh, break the treaty with Taiwan, was to pull U.S. troops off of Taiwan. And by the way, there were quite a few U.S. troops on Taiwan because they helped uh, fight the Vietnam War. Um, so Taiwan was a very close ally. Uh, but then members of Congress, as that process was unfolding, 1972 to 1979, members of Congress said, no way are we going to allow this ha to happen. So the Taiwan Relations Act, which you probably know well, was passed by a bipartisan, uh, you know, bipartisan, uh, overwhelmingly bipartisan group of congressmen and senators uh, to basically say, OK, fine, you know, that then President Carter, uh, 1979, you can go ahead and de-recognize Taiwan, uh, but we are going to pass a law that essentially allows for a very robust, unofficial, meaning not an official diplomatic relationship, but everything else. So cultural ties, economic ties, security ties, arms sales, uh, and all the rest of it. That was passed in 1979. It is the law of the land. It governs our relations with Taiwan. The, the People's Republic of China hates that law. Um, you know, we, we uh, part, part of what you mentioned before, why is it that uh, Speaker Pelosi and, and the Congress take such a great interest in Taiwan is because of the Taiwan's Rel Taiwan Relations Act, often a source of tension between the legislative branch and the executive branch. Um, so so uh, we said, OK, we're going to recognize, you know, we, we fudged the issue diploma diplomatically. We said we have a one China policy, you know, which now recognizes Beijing diplomatically. Uh, but we're going to have this unofficial relationship with Taiwan. And part of the deal with China was that we would go ahead and de-recognize Taiwan and abrogate the mutual defense treaty, uh, but they would have to commit to a peaceful resolution of the dispute they had with Taiwan. That's fundamental, foundational, peaceful resolution. And we said, now fast forward a little bit to the Reagan administration, we said uh, publicly that a peaceful resolution the way we would decide whether they were committed to a peaceful resolution was tied towards their military posture against the Taiwan Strait. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's how we were going to decide whether they were committed to peace. So obviously, last 20 to 25 years, uh, one has to conclude that that their commitment to a peaceful resolution is quite questionable. OK, one what, one question I have thinking through all this is <laughs> what is it seems very emotional for the Chinese to to claim that uh, Taiwan is theirs and it's it's one country. I mean, is, is is there a better reason for this besides they just believe it? Says it, it sounds like it hasn't been part of uh, a unified China for hundred and 
25 years at least. So what's, what's, what's their deal? What's their argument? Well, you know, it's, it's a great question because uh, it is very emotional and it's, it's kind of like Putin and, and the Ukraine. Now there's some, yeah. <laughs> there's some substantive interests, right? I mean, yeah. this is my sphere of influence. I don't want, you know, a U.S. Uh, military and U.S. security partner so close to my shores, but basically it's, you know, it's, we were humiliated uh, by the Japanese in 1895. We in China were carved up, not just by the Chinese, by the Japanese, I'm sorry, but by, um, you know, the British and the French and, 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 you know, the history of China in the 1800s is quite humiliating. Mm. And Taiwan is a memory of this humiliation. And until we get Taiwan back, we cannot be a great country again. That's number one. Number two is Taiwan became a democracy. So this entire period that I was describing, when we recognized the nationalist government on Taiwan, uh, Taiwan was a, was a Cold War ally, but it was an authoritarian Cold War ally. Taiwan became a democracy, a real liberal democracy in the 1990s. And at that point in time, the nationalists started to lose power. The party that's in power today, the Democratic Progressive Party, came to power. They were the native Taiwanese who were there before the nationalists surrendered and, and moved to the island. And China is very threatened by the fact that inside a Chinese cultural context, there's a, there's a thriving democracy. Hmm. Um, and, and that's very threatening to them. Um, uh, so that there's an ideological threat to them. They, they believe there's a, um, you know, there's, there's this emotional, we got to reunify. We've already taken Hong Kong back. We've, we've suppressed Tibet. We've suppressed Xinjiang. Taiwan's the last remaining holdout hmm. from our time of humiliation. Yeah, it doesn't seem rational to a, a Westerner necessarily, but I suppose if you're a conqueror um, of, of this kind of Eastern mindset, then I guess it's, I guess it's rational. Um, I, I mean, I see the, I see the practical value for, for why they want to do it um, and, and historical value. But again, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to, to pretend that they, that they truly believe that there's a kinship <laughs> that they need to reunify. I, I, they, they can't possibly believe that or I wonder if they even lie to themselves about that well you know part of the reason that things are getting less stable is that the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping is realizing that no Taiwanese would voluntarily accept Chinese rule Chinese Communist mm -hmm. Party rule and and so they know that right so th what they're left with are these coercive and military yeah. instruments I will say that from a strategic point of view from the U.S. strategy point of view, for U.S. interest point of view, um, if, if China forcefully controlled Taiwan, uh, we would be in a worse strategic situation. So it doesn't, so, so it would extend their influence out a little bit further and put a lot of pressure on our ally Japan, perhaps mm -hmm. the Philippines too. So, so there, are, there is, as always, real ge geopolitical interests that are um, you know, manifest here as well. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's one of the topics I want to discuss today. We might as well dis discuss. Well, let, let me get to that because I, I okay. want to go into a lot of detail on yeah. why, why it yeah. matters. Um, you know, I've been, I've been hitting this topic pretty hard with respect to Russia, Ukraine. You know, you've got our right wing populists who are like, I mean, what do I care what happens in Ukraine? Well, I mean, look, that sounds good when you just blurt it out at your local diner and people cheer for you, but it's not real. Okay. The, the, the world is a smaller place than you would like to think. And so I, I do want to get into that, but that's a, that's a, let's, let's really hit that in detail later. Um, I want to, I want to finish out the history a little bit because, um, and I want to focus on one thing, the difference between how Clinton viewed the Taiwan relationship and how Bush did. And it's interesting that Clinton um, operated off these three no's basically, I mean, I'll, I, I could probably find them real quick and say what they are, but it was, um, I probably should just for the sake of uh, the, the proper conversation here. Okay, no support for independence. So that's pretty clear. No support for a two China or a one China, one Taiwan policy. So the one China policy. No support for Taiwan's admittance into any international organization that requires statehood for membership. Uh, 2001, Bush administration reversed this. Um, it, it was pretty clear where the Republicans are going. Newt Gingrich visited Taiwan famously, right? That's the last speaker of the House visit uh, was in 1997, I think. Yep. So, so there's, there's, obviously there's a partisan divide here. What's behind, because Clinton's, Clinton's a weird guy, but 
he ain't that dumb when it comes to foreign policy. Never has been. He's, he's, he's been pretty smart on it, at least sophisticated. Uh, doesn't mean he's right, but he's, he's no dummy. Why, why did he feel the way he felt about Taiwan? And was this, was this part of the broader illusion that most American foreign policy experts were under really until recently? Well, it, it, it's a perfectly timed question because it happened pretty much right at the crisis point and in, in, under the Clinton administration of, of Taiwan-China relations. So what happened back then is, I mean, this is how emotional and, and um, irrational the Chinese get. So what happened was that the uh, president of Taiwan, Li Dongwei, who was really the father of Taiwan democracy, Li Dongwei, um, went to Cornell. So he got his PhD at Cornell, in, I think agricultural economics. Mm -hmm. And he was invited to give a, um, a talk, either it was a commencement talk or something equivalent. And um, the Clinton administration said no, because that was the policy at the time. This, this kind of strange policy we had in terms of what the unofficial relationship with Taiwan meant. So no to a president coming from Taiwan, yes to a foreign minister coming. I mean, really, when you get in the weeds and you, you, you're a policymaker inside the government trying to figure this out, it's, it's exceptionally confusing. But um, the Congress, again, uh, voted almost unanimously to say grant him the visa. Um, they didn't have to take a vote, obviously, to grant him a visa. They, they passed a, uh, a resolution. The pressure on Clinton was unbearable. So, so they granted uh, Lee Dung-wei the visa, came to Cornell, um, and um, gave the talk. The Chinese, um, as the next presidential election in Taiwan was taking place, started to fire missiles like they're doing now into the Taiwan Strait to pressure the Taiwanese government to vote the quote right way, not for this Li Dong Wei guy to vote. Ironically, I can't I can't help but picture an angry ex-girlfriend throwing their cell phone into the water every time like <laughs> they do something yeah. bad. It's a, that's exactly what I was picturing this last time. Anyway. Right. No, it was it, it just um, I mean, dealing with this back when I was in government in the, in the Bush administration, I mean, the the um, diplomatic protests over every little thing. I mean, you know, you you raise the flag, the Taiwanese flag next to the American flag at a Fourth of July. Nothing, nothing was too small for no slight too small mm -hmm. for protest. Uh, but but the, the the problem is that that it works, right? So that's my concern right now with the, with the Chinese um, temper tantrum they're having across the Taiwan Strait is right the pressure on the United States. So the three nos came out of that. It was kind of a quietly negotiated way for hmm. for Bill Clinton to say to the Chinese, you know, okay, you know, fine, we will we will de-escalate the pressure. The Chinese always always put pressure on us to de-escalate, even though they're yeah. asking, right. And so I know we, people and, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 we 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 always are the ones that have to apologize and de-escalate, and so we had to say these things publicly, and then we could go back to normal. Right and normal yeah. met negotiating the World Trade Organization treaty and all that. So you know the the, the concern is this coercion and intimidation works right and the pressure. Right. Comes. And we've we've let them continue to escalate and continue to, to push us just a little because we're always the bigger guy, right? So we're always the bigger guy. So we're like, fine, fine. If you'll just stop yapping at me, fine. And that's been going on for 20, 30 years as a, as a, of the, as they have rapidly um, enhanced their capabilities across all fronts, economic and, and militarily. And it does seem like we're all kind of waking up to it now. It does seem like there's a broad consensus that this is, this is, a, this is a, there, there will be no peaceful and the rise of China. There will be no democratizing of China. It will never happen. It is, it is a totally backwards society antithetical to, to everything we stand for. That's, that's the good news, I think, I suppose. I mean, it is interesting talking about this illusion. I'm, I'm currently reading uh, the Hundred Year Marathon. Um, I uh, was it uh, Pillsbury is the, the author. Yeah, Michael Pillsbury. And um, it's it's pretty good. Uh, it, and it's interesting. One of the things that stood out to me was how they would receive um, uh, two different defectors, you know, from China. One clearly a double agent. One perhaps not. And they chose wrong every single time because they wanted. They wanted to hear uh, from the defector that was telling them that you know that China was pro-American, that, that that you have to keep supporting these 
these reformers and these rebels and these liberals within the within the Chinese Communist Party. If you if you just keep doing that, they'll, they'll gain strength, and we promise you it'll it'll change. And then there's these others saying like this is this is completely untrue. This is what they're actually saying. This is the history of China. This is this is the doctrine that they fall back on. The stories they tell themselves of ancient history about how to how to manipulate and trick your enemies into believing that you're weak and then striking later. We're trying to tell you this is what's happening, and and, and we didn't listen. I, mean, I it's 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 fascinating what the group think was. I mean, you've been probably doing this for a long time. How did how was how have your um, uh, opinions evolved on this? And did you see this transition? Well, I, you know, I. Um... I thought there were a problem, frankly, since I lived there in 1999. I mean, so I, I, um, you know, I went, I went to live there and learn Chinese and I was told this was, this was at the height of engagement and, and hope. Right. And, and we were going to help them into the world trade organization and we did. And, um, and there was, there was a lot of reform in China, to be fair, there really was. I mean, you really, you know, there was a buzz around entrepreneurship and economics and so on. They did, at that time allow for that sort of thing to happen. So, so, so you could see that, but, but I just remember 1999, I just remember living among students in China being told before I left that the next generation was the hope of the future if you engage them and so on. And, and I just remember the nationalistic fervor and the anti-American fervor, you know, so 1999 was a year that, um, that, that we, mistakenly, really mistakenly bombed um, the Chinese embassy in Belgrade during operations mm. in Kosovo, but they did not believe it was mistaken. They don't believe we make mistakes. And the, they just surrounded the U.S. embassy and they, they, the Chinese government was supporting this. They were busing people in and the ambassador was just besieged at the time, James Sasser. And, and I just, I just, you know, was kind of shot and that was just one of three things the next you won't even believe this but the next thing they overreacted to was the Falun Gong which is this this uh Tai Chi sect Wait, can, can we go back to the first one because yeah, like sure. I, I, I've read about this and it's it's a crazy story yes yeah. like and so I just want to yeah I just want to exa exaggerate the story just a little bit for the, yeah. for the listeners so we accidentally bombed an embassy in Belgrade during a war Okay, yeah. this is this is the Kosovo War. Yeah. Um, immediately apologize. Immediately express right. yeah. like very publicly, multiple times, over and over again. The president that it was obviously a mistake. Um, and and uh, it, it, how how did all these protesters get there? Were they paid in as thousands? They basically besieged the embassy the way we see in, in a place like Benghazi, like a third world country. But this was happening in China for days, was it not? It was. So, so there, there is real rage and anger that, that it, it's a thing. It exists, you know. It's um, well, they're told know. propaganda about us constantly. It's, it's, it's kind of like kind of yeah. like the Russians. I mean, I've, I've met Russians who think crazy things about America. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Absolutely, it, it, it's it's anti-Japanese, anti-U.S. Um, and uh, but but the, the the real anger, like the the thing that you know, they, in China they have a saying you know, riding the tiger. So letting too much protest, it starts to turn on them because historically in China, um, and I have some of this in my own book that you mentioned, The China Nightmare. Um, historically in China, if you, if you allow for too much protest against foreigners, all of a sudden the regime gets blamed for being too weak against the foreigners. So they kind of try to calibrate. But in this case, it's like they were angry and they, they needed some kind of um, way to vent that anger, right? And the propaganda about the United States keeping us down and all, all that. And so they, they took them, the, there were government buses taking students to the embassy, to the U.S. embassy. They didn't have to do too much to rile them up. They, they were angry. Mm -hmm. but, but to, and then they had to quickly clamp down on that. So it was four or five days. And then mm -hmm. the, Chinese, the Chinese had to quickly say, okay, that's enough. You know, that, that, that's enough. It's time to go back because this could get out of control. So it was this kind of Potemkin rage, right? This kind of let's vent, let's vent, yeah. let's, vent let's not let it get too out of control, though. Uh, but, but you know, once you got back into the dorms where I was living, I mean, it was students were just furious and spinning out conspiracy theories about the United States and, and um, just irrational um, 
you know, yeah. we're going to get you kind of things. Vengeance will be ours over the long term. You could, you could, I could feel it. I, I was always surprised that, that, that uh, we were surprised that, that China was turned, you know, quote, turned on us. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there was that in 1999, there was the Falun Gong sect, this kind of breathing Tai Chi sect, which they had banned, you know, they, they were, they banned everything that um, posed any kind of organized alternative to the party had showed up in Tiananmen Square in protest silently, um, surprising the regime. They thought we were behind that too, that the CIA was, you know, they thought the CIA, is, they think the CIA is behind everything, right? And mm-hmm. so, yeah. And then there was a third incident. And, and so I just, I just came back and said, oh my God, I mean, this, this, this is a country that's developing so fast, does not like us, does not want us in the region, um, you know, and, and, and have been working on, on that you know, since, since that time. And the, but you're right, the sea change really kind of, nobody wanted to hear it um, until 2017 or so. Um, and, and then, you know, now everyone's sort of, you know, like you said, there's a consensus forming, but there was a small group of us who, who were saying, these guys are our biggest problem. I mean, they're, they're yeah. going to compete with us on every dimension of power. Well, okay, so let's, let's move fast forward to Pelosi's visit. Um, Pelosi has been pretty consistent on, on that being in that camp of kind of anti skeptic, China skeptic for quite a while. We'll give her that. Um, <clears throat> any ideas of why she thought it was necessary now to, to visit Taiwan and, you know, what, what, what is the best argument for, for us interest for Taiwan? Well, um, so let me take the, the first one yeah. for, for her. So Speaker Pelosi, as you say, has, has long been a staunch supporter of, of Taiwan, of democracy movements when they existed in China before they were um, destroyed, of, of Tibet, of, of Xinjiang. She's been pretty solid on, on human rights in China and so on. Um, why she decided, you know, the, the plan was to go before she got COVID and, and, and so on. She probably sees the U.S. political calendar and wants to still go as speaker and, and so on. And, and um True. You know, and so, so, uh, but you know, this this shouldn't have been a big deal. I mean, you know, it's precedent. Now we have to stick to our precedent when it comes yeah. to the one China policy. I mean, we have to define what it means for us. We cannot let China define what what does it mean for us. <laughs> that nobody yeah. see, nobody knows. This. Right, right. So really, this is what it means for us. And and I think one of the best testimonies on on this was by Assistant Secretary of State at the time, James Kelly, under the, under the George W. Bush administration, and he called it our, our one China policy. He called it our one China policy. The Chinese say our one China principle, our one China policy, which means, okay, we're not recognizing Taiwan as a diplomatic co- country. We're not starting the alliance again, but we have, uh, we have never, ever acknowledged China's sovereignty over Taiwan. We have always stuck to our, you know, they have to solve this issue through peaceful means, through negotiations, whatever their dispute with Taiwan is. We have the Taiwan Relations Act and something called the Six Assurances that Ronald Reagan uh, announced that assures Taiwan of all sorts of things and that we will never make a deal with China behind their backs. They will continue arms sales and, and, and uh, mm. other types of security relationships, that we will have a robust, unofficial relationship with Taiwan, and we do. We have a very good economic relationship with Taiwan. We have a very good cultural relationship with Taiwan. We have a de facto embassy in Taiwan that we can't call an embassy. Um, So our one China policy means official diplomatic relations with China, very strong unofficial ties and warm ties with Taiwan. Uh, Okay, so that's clarifying. It, or when we say one China policy, we're saying this is our description of what China says one China policy is. <laughs> and what we say it is, is a little different than what China says it is. We don't recognize China's one China policy. That's different because right. they, they say they have sovereignty over Taiwan. We explicitly say we do not recognize that. Right. We're not, we're not saying they're independent and part of the UN and we have an embassy. We're not saying we're not quite going there, but we're going to do literally everything that we would normally do with any other country. We're going to give them as much international space and as much dignity as we possibly can, short of recognizing them as an official country. Okay, and 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 so, why? 
so we, we've, uh, you, I think you're right. I think the reason Pelosi decided she needed to go now is because maybe she's been putting it off and she knows she's not going to be speaker um, by next year. And it's, it's probably a good time to do it um, better now than ever, never. Um, right. But, but it shouldn't be that big of a deal. I was previously planning a Taiwan trip. We can do it for various reasons. Members of Congress visit all the time. Um, it, it happens quite a bit. We send staff there all the time um, to, to learn, interact, all of it. it. It's very, very normal. And it happens many, many times a year, but it's the speaker of the house. And this, this really upset the Chinese. Um, well, what, what, what do you, what are your, do you give kudos to Pelosi for not backing down on this? What do you think of the Biden administration for kind of pulling the rug out from under her a little bit? I think the Biden administration made a huge mistake. Yeah. I mean, and, and it scares so the hell out of me actually, because it was kind of a green light. I mean, they, they need to stop giving green lights to enemies. I really don't know when they're going to learn their lesson on this, but. I mean, you cannot agree with China that that we're provoking them by sending, a, you know, a, a speaker, and and you can just that's an agreement with them. Like you know, that's against our one China policy. They will define everything as provocations. I mean, you're opening the door for them to define the next arms sale as a provocation, the right. next congressional visit as a provocation. They thought the movie Top Gun was a provocation. Not, yeah, the Top Gun was a provocation. I mean, you cannot let China define. What your policy is, and and that's that's part of the contest. It's an informational contest, it's a political contest, it's an economic and military contest, you know. And so we just seeded the ground on the information space, and so and, and not only that, but it's very important for 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 any U.S. president to keep reiterating over and over again: there's a congressional branch and there's an executive branch, and China has to understand the difference between the two, yeah. because if, if you seed that ground, then they start coming at you as if you can do something about the Taiwan Relations Act. Right? And they so, eventually they eventually did say that. But, you know, at first they were like, well, we really don't recommend it at this time. We're a little worried. I'm like, what, what are they going to Are they really going to? We got to call people's bluff at a certain point, you know, call Putin's bluff, call Xi Jinping's bluff. They're yeah. not going to blow Pelosi out of the sky. They're just it's not going to do it. It's self-deterrent. I mean, if we really thought that that uh, that China was crazy enough to shoot at the Speaker of the House, then we've got bigger problems. The president, the president should have been calling for emergency funding for, I mean, you know, if yeah. you really take that logic, you know, I, you know, you just cannot believe those sorts of threats and that sort of bullying. So they've been launching missiles into the Taiwan Straits forever, as you, as you pointed out. Is this time any different? Is, is, this, is this a more significant visit? They're more capable, as you said, much more capable than they were mm -hmm. 23 years ago. I mean, we've, those of us who've been in this business for a while, it's like, watching a train wreck. I mean, we've watched the Chinese military modernize, you know, for I got 25, 26 years, maybe more, 27 years since mm -hmm. the end of the Cold War. They've modernized across all dimensions of power. They they just have more capability. The 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 way they exercise now is different than the way they exercised even 10 years ago. And so there's much more to be concerned about in you know in the United States in terms of their actual capability to do something serious. To Taiwan, so that's 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 materially different. I mean, that's you know their ability to to um, coerce, intimidate, blockade, effectuate a, a, an invasion. Maybe not yet. Um, um, you know, uh, really punish U.S. forces coming to the aid of Taiwan if we decide to do so. Japanese forces is 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 materially different than it has been. Uh, you know, than it was even 10, 10, 15 years ago. What what is their capabilities right now, and what's the well, forget that question. You kind of answered that. We generally know what their capabilities are. They're bad. They, they can do a lot of anti-area, anti-area um, access and denial. Um, people say that we would lose a war to them. Now, it's worth clarifying what, what that study means is we would, we would fail to beat them in their own backyard. It doesn't mean we would lose an all-out war with China. It just means if we had to forward deploy to Taiwan, it would be very, very difficult because they've they've effectively designed their weapon systems to fight right there. Whereas we de we design for everything, we design for the whole world and global conflict and all sorts of types of conflict, and we need to catch up in a few areas. Um, but but more more curious about what their plans are, um, and do you think they can really implement some of these plans? I, I know it, it strikes me as pretty difficult to invade Taiwan. Um, what is the Davidson window, uh, and is that realistic? What would what would your own uh, predictions be on on Chinese intentions? The Davidson window is uh, Admiral Phil da Davidson, who is the commander of the Indo Pacific Command um, out in Hawaii, 
uh, as he was as he was leaving his command, uh, said that uh, we have until 2027 um, to uh, fill the gaps in our military capabilities and deter uh, deter China from attacking Taiwan. That they will have the capabilities at that point to actually invade and occupy the island. And, and you know, this gets into the military weeds about you know what that means and and. and you know they're going to have enough amphibious care, you know, amphibious capabilities and all the rest of it. Um, so it's possible. I mean, if you're if you're sort of um, if you're if you're measuring this on on Chinese capabilities alone, it's it's possible that they will have more capabilities to actually invade and occupy, you know, do airborne landings and airborne assaults and so on by 2027. Um, but they don't necessarily need to do that, is my is my view. So. My view of Chinese strategy uh, is is it's more incremental and coercive uh, than that. So what they're doing with these exercises, for example, is um, changing the status quo, the facts on the ground. They did this in the South China Sea. They mm -hmm. they are now operating in Taiwan um, past what's called the medium the median line. Mm -hmm. There's a line that the United States kind of drew up that both sides cannot cross across the Taiwan Strait, which are international waters, international airspace. The Chinese are slowly violating that. They are, um, you know, they, they are essentially setting up zones uh, around which shipping has to go around on the uh, southeast, southeastern part of Taiwan and, and northeast, northeastern part of Taiwan, as well as to the west. Um, uh, you know, virtual blockades, essentially. International shipping has been has been um, is there no trade this is a dumb question but a basic one is there no trade between taiwan and china see that's the thing there's a lot of trade between okay china and but but and you know, i'm sure i'm saying you can get on a flight from yeah. taipei to shanghai right yes absolutely I, you know i mean china depends on taiwan as everyone else does for advanced semiconductors for example mm -hmm. so so you have to which is a good window into the thinking here so Xi Jinping would have to come to a position where it's so zero sum. In, in other words, he's calculating that his attack on Taiwan would hurt the, his enemies, Taiwan, the United States, Japan, worse than the pain that he would inflict on himself, the economic pain, you know, so it's worth it, right? So he's abandoned, you know, at that point, he sort of abandoned caring about trade with Taiwan, let alone the United States and, and, and Japan. Um, but but yeah anyway they're I think they're salami slicing they're they're trying to get us to do the equivalent of three no's now to self deter to be in a position where we de escalate quote where we where we start to question ourselves about whether we want to continue normal practices arms sales congressional visits high level visits of executive branch officials uh, high level visits of, of of general and flag officers. Now, they want to isolate Taiwan. They want to say to Taiwan, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. Like, you may not want to be part of us, but the United States is not going to defend you, right? And they want to say, they want to say then that through, they want to show through military force that the airspace and the, and the maritime space around Taiwan is not international airspace. It is Chinese domestic uh, territory. And and that's that's what they're trying to do right now, and we have to demonstrate that that's not the case. That it's international airspace. So I mean, how, how do we do that? What's the best path forward? Um, and, and this will lead us to you know, why should we even care? Um, it, is it is it more um, more clarity on our declarations that we would defend Taiwan? Is it better? weapons uh, and arms being sold to Taiwan that allowed them to defend themselves. I think most people would probably land on that option. Uh, make, make it such an untenable target that, it, it, that, that the Chinese would inevitably face the same failures that Putin faced when he invaded Ukraine. Well, I, so I'd say um, number one is absolutely continue with arms sales to Taiwan, expedite arms sales. Uh, How far know. behind are we on this situation? Because, it, I mean, it seems to me like it's not like these types of weapons don't exist. It, it seems to me that it, <laughs> we've been talking about this for 20 years, at least. 
why why don't we have the right weapons in Taiwan that just that just make it a, an untenable target for the Chinese? So so a couple reasons. Um, you know that right now we're we have a problem. We're telling Taiwan to buy things we're we're running out of because of Ukraine. You know things like javelin systems and stinger systems. So we've long had a defense industrial base. So so I'd say I I, I categorize that as. U.S. not paying adequate attention to its own defense industrial base and defense resources for mm -hmm. capabilities that are relevant to a fight with China should we have to or deterrence of China. Yeah. So that, I put that in one category. The next category I'd say is is so many, despite the good unofficial relations with Taiwan, so many self-imposed obstacles uh, with Taiwan on um, training them exercising with them, all the kinds of things you would want to do um, to get mm -hmm. another military ready, to be able to operate effectively with that military, to shape that military. Taiwan military is completely isolated without contact with the United States. Nobody else, they have some contact, it's better, but nobody else does anything with them. So it's it's partly that. Uh, it's probably Taiwan's own sort of hidebound bureaucratic culture. But um, you know, right now, not, for me, none of that past matters. What matters now is you know, like an operation warp speed to break through all the bureaucratic snafus and just get Taiwan as many arms as you as you can right now, right? And and with an urgency that we're not seeing. Um, and that would be number one. And and th that would do two things. One, that would say to China, after these exercises and after the Pelosi visit. No, I'm sorry. We're going back to normal here. We're, we're still doing our arms sales. We're still dedicated to the self-defense of Taiwan. Um, and number two, it would actually give them the capabilities that would make the Chinese think twice about an invasion. The, the third thing, though, is this, this gets tricky because, you know, China should think we're coming to Taiwan's defense. That's what will ultimately deter, right? Mm -hmm. And they should think that we are able to operate effectively. Um, and that that's getting our own house in order defense-wise. That's certain issues with related to posture in Japan, certain issues related to posture in the Philippines, uh, China should think we're coming and we, we should be clear to them. I have no problem with Biden saying out loud, you know, we will defend Taiwan. It's just, you can't say that and then walk away from it and then not have a defense posture that's ready to actually back that up. So, you know, it, it, that, that's the, that's the problem. Yeah. And you know, the, the Russia, Ukraine, conflict has demonstrated to me some pretty um, interesting strains of thought, uh, especially on the conservative side on on how they think about foreign policy. There, there's there's a there's a very loud populist isolationist movement that shocked me, um, frankly, as as this conflict occurred. Um, they've been wrong on every every issue they've ever thought about, um, but they 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 <laughs> They somehow manipulate every every single fact that proves them wrong into a fact that proves them right. It's fascinating to me. Tucker Carlson is is is, is expert at this. He's an expert at this. Like wrong about everything. Um, from the Afghanistan withdrawal uh, to Ukraine, all of it. But they get mad for even sending aid. I mean, and and of course, like they they make proclamations that aren't true. Like if you, if you send aid, we're gonna they're gonna get us into a nuclear war. Well, that never happened. Never materialized. Um, you were wrong, but you can't admit it. Um, and so now it's just, uh, well, you know, there's baby formula problems here. How can we be sending weapons to Ukrainians? Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, God, if we had more javelins, we just kept the javelins in the United States, then we would have baby right. formula on the, on right. the, on the right. shelves. Not totally. Yeah. I mean, and so it's, I guess my, my point in making fun of them as I almost, as I do as often as possible on my podcast um is to is to point out that that, that the political difficulties are, are serious here yeah um it, yeah. it's hard to see you know forget the ice the crazy isolationists um you know just just look at normal americans it, it's tough to see them uh wanting to really go to war with, with with china over it which is why i'm so intent on the prevention side yes just like we should have been intent on that during uh for the ukraine conflict it, you could have now, now luckily with ukraine you could you can still get weapons in there post-conflict but that is not going to be the case with Taiwan. That's right. And so what does the world start to look like if, if China does militarily invade Taiwan, assassinates their leader and, and, and takes over? I mean, what does that look like to, for our economy? Why should we care? What are the ripple effects of that? And what, how, what's the best argument for why Americans should care about this issue? 
Well, you know, the, the it, it, it's a difficult argument, but the, you know, the foundation, the foundations of U.S. security since World War II, you know, have been this forward posture. You know, it, it, you don't know what you have till it's gone, right? This forward posture, the 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 decision after a terrible Pacific War, a slog, terrible slog by U.S. Marines and and and. Uh, Army soldiers and, and the Navy, you know, losing unbelievable amounts of weaponry and personnel and people, to, and then to basically say we're never doing that again. We're staying here. We're staying put in Japan. You know, mm-hmm. we have always faced threats to the Pacific and um, and to the Atlantic, and we're just uh, the forward defense of, of the United States. We're going to defend here, and we're not going to defend Hawaii. I mean, we're just never doing that again. And yeah. so, keeping faith with that is extremely important. Often, o- often overlooked. You know, the, the the beginning of World War II, you know, the Taiwan, the Taiwan of then was the Philippines. The U.S. had troops in the Philippines and and was attacked mercilessly, and it led then after that to the attack on Pearl Harbor. So 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 it's it's um, foundationally U.S. security and economic prosperity is tied to the forward defense that we have maintained since 1945. More concretely, if China uh, attacked Taiwan, the the global economy would tank and China wouldn't care about it. I mean, all global electronics uh, essentially are made, you know, from Taiwan to Japan to South Korea. Uh, it would tank. There's no replacement. I mean, the Congress passed a, the CHIPS Act. It does something, something to, to replace. But there's really, it's not like oil. You can't just go find wells. I mean, these are capable, you know, so right. global economy would tank. If China actually successfully took Taiwan and started to pressure uh, Japan, and the, and the whole sort of Japanese island chain uh, and started to unravel the U.S. system, then they would have a say. They would have the most say over how the U.S. conducts its business, its commercial enterprise uh, inside the, the, the most important economic region in the world. They would be able to coerce us. And there's no question if you watch the way the CCP acts, they would coerce us. They would, they would, they would have coercive economic leverage over us and they would use it. And, Are you in a storm right now? Yeah, yeah. No, we're not getting, we're not getting bombed. It's just an unbelievable storm. Where, like, where, where are you? Are you in, in Maryland. Washington, Maryland? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that was perfectly timed, though, with with the Chinese. Yeah, yeah. It was very China. ominous. Yeah. So, um, um. Anyway, that I mean, these these are they're concrete. They're very concrete reasons. Um, and then there's and then there's also just this, you know things start to unravel uh, the foundations of U.S. security and prosperity, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's like a cascade. It's like a cancer that just starts to spread. Um, yeah. and, and there's not much you can do. And you're right to focus on prevention. This can still be prevented, but you have to have the capabilities and, and demonstrate to China the, the will that, that you're willing to prevent it. Right. Now, that, now they would say, now the isolationists well, would would indignantly suggest that, oh, so you want to start a war just to prevent a future war that you're not even sure is going to happen. And, and my answer to them is always, well, the, the costs are coming either way. History tells us that over and over and over again. The costs get greater with further inaction every single time. You can choose not to believe that. You can choose not to study your history and believe that simple fact. You can choose to believe that if the, if the Chinese just get this one more island, that they'll be nice after that. If, if, if Putin just gets Ukraine, then he'll be nice after that. He has no interest in any of these other you know, Russian uh, ethnicities located in, say, Latvia. Uh, he has no interest whatsoever. He'll just be nice. Right. You can believe that. Um, and, you know, I can I can I can sell you some oceanfront property in Nebraska. Maybe that would be nice. You know, I, I don't live in that world um, to expand on your pound or on your point earlier about how we never wanted to go back to this. Right. Post World War Two, we never wanted to go back to the situation where we. We had to expend a massive amount of resources um, and taking island after island after island again and, and letting it happen. There's an, there's an interest in preventing it at the beginning when the costs are lower. Um, and, and I also, I just always refute this argument that we're starting a war. Again, the isolationists were wrong about Russia. They've been wrong. They were wrong about Afghanistan. They said that if we just left then there would be peace. Well, that's not what happened. We lost 13 Marines. It, it, nothing made me angrier than watching Tucker Carlson have the nerve to even criticize Joe Biden because Joe Biden did exactly what Tucker Carlson wanted him to do. Exactly. To the T. Pull out everybody right now. You know, no ifs, ands, or buts. No middle ground whatsoever. Not even Trump was 
I, I think, thinking of doing that. You know, it would have at least left people in Bog- Bagram. Um, they've been wrong on every front, and it's, it's, it's getting dangerous. You start to lose people um, in, in this kind of situation, and you, you, you can't have this naive outlook of the world. You have to understand that, that the world is pretty interconnected, uh, a lot smaller than we would like it to be, a lot smaller than it was in the 1700s, 1800s, because this is the interconnectedness of the world that you can't, you can't possibly escape that fact. Um, and it, it, I, I find it pretty critical that we convince the American people of that. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's also, you know, it's, there are dangerous, dangerous tyrants out there who don't, will not leave us alone. You know, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's just not, they will not leave us alone. I mean, as, as you say, the, um, the seas, the world's much smaller. So maybe isolationists in the, in the 1930s could, could convince themselves that what went on in Europe and, and, um, you know, in, in the yeah. Pacific, you know, it was slightly more true back then. Maybe, you know, maybe, but that also proved wrong, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, people who didn't want to get into war until really it was, it was very late, um, you know, were proven wrong and, and saw, you know, the United States was attacked, right, to keep us out. And, and so uh, the Chinese have capabilities, developing capabilities that, that put a lot of pressure on our own homeland. You know, they're setting up bases in the Solomon Islands. It's getting closer and closer to the United States. The intent is they don't like the United States. Intended is not just to displace us from the Asia Pacific, but to have coercive leverage over us, uh, so that we can't do what we want in the world, and and that would affect every American. I mean, you know, every American who uh, enjoys commerce, who enjoys uh, just sort of the fruits of engagement with the world, and and we just we just can't let that happen. I don't think a lot of people realize where the things they love come from, and how interconnected that is, and to an extent, we we should be domesticating a lot of that to, 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 to the greatest extent that we can. Um, but in the end, our trading partners that we desperately need are still not necessarily in our hemisphere. And we do have an interest in, in making sure that those relationships remain open and uncoerced. Um, you know, that the la- last question I want to ask you, I don't know if you're familiar with Peter Zion's work. He was on this podcast a, a, a bit ago and he, he, he uh, worked at Stratfor for quite a while. Um, just wrote a book called the, uh, the, the the End of the World is Just the Beginning. It's an interesting analysis. He's he, he focuses on demography mostly. Um, uh, he actually predicted Russia would invade Ukraine this huh. year, and he predicted <laughs> that back in 2014. And he did so just saying that the main reason I say that is because of Russians' demographics. They're aging mm. so quickly. This yeah. is the last time. So it, it, interesting thinker. He was on the podcast um, uh, month or so ago. And his big prediction in that new book is that China implodes uh, in the near future, 10 to 15 years, primarily because of their overfinancing and their demographic collapse. They have the, the fastest aging population in the world, which is not a healthy place to be. I mean, what, so what's, what do you think of that? It, it's absolutely, it, so in, in, in my own book, the reason I call it the China nightmare, the, the grand ambitions of a decaying state is is because, uh, and it, it sounds sort of decaying state. What are you talking about? I mean, this is this is the mm-hmm. ascending state. Is because there's this there's this dangerous mixture of 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 ascending in some important ways. We talked about the military modernization and the diplomatic confidence and so on. But demographics are terrible. I mean, it's 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 it is the fastest aging population. And when you talk about the scale of China and you say fast it's aging, you're talking about a cohort of over sixty five that is you know. 100 million or more, you know, you're talking about a, a big country of old people, you know, just, just, just that one cohort. So they've got that problem. They've got a problem with uh, too many men, you know, because mm-hmm. of the sex selective abortion issue. Mm-hmm. So because of the one, one child policy, they um, had a preference for males. So a lot of unmarried, un, unmarriageable, not even unmarried, unmarriageable males who will not find brides in China with huge social problems. That we're already seeing, uh, you know, on, on China's borders, and then yes, the big problems economically, um, you know, it's it's backing off on economic market reforms and so forth. So, so there are a lot of problems in China. I think what we've seen in the last few years is um, is is China thinks it needs to consolidate some gains now, mm-hmm. and and we've seen that in their behavior with respect to COVID. 
we've seen that in their march into Hong Kong, you know, sooner than most people thought. Yeah. And then that, you know, that their aggress- more aggressiveness around Taiwan and the South China Sea. The, the COVID issue, um, I, I think, should tell people that e- even if you were skeptical, you, you didn't like China. So, right, there's, there's, the, there's, there's the camp that existed for far too long where we had um, this rosy eyed view of what China was. And then there was the camp that didn't. But then there's this other camp that is, you know, kind of scared of China and says, geez, you know, these, these people are like governing scientists. They can just figure things out 50 years in the future. They don't deal with these pesky elections and, and Twitter yeah, wars right, and all that. Right. But then they then they do this weird thing with zero COVID policy, which has like is maybe the worst policy you can imagine. It's it's just killing people. It's destroying the economy. So it uh, it does make me a little bit more bullish on 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 our ability to uh, compete and defeat them in in the in the future because they're that that's some crazy illogical thinking. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's this period of time in the Cold War. You know, we've been here before as a country, right? So after Vietnam, um, also terrible divisions in the United States and so on, uh, you know, the, the people thought we couldn't compete with the Soviets anymore, you know, that they marched in Afghanistan and so on. And we had, we had some leaders, who, and including the advent of Ronald Reagan a few years after that, that, that said, no, we can. We can. I mean, we're, we're on our back feet, but, you know, their system doesn't make any sense to me. And there's a little bit of that with China. It's not the Soviet Union. It's much more economically viable and, and trading w- with the rest of the world. But look, you know, as you said, I mean, zero COVID, I mean, stapling people into their houses so they don't come out and, and you know, a police state, you know, it's very expensive to maintain a, a surveillance state of that kind and constantly mm-hmm. afraid of coups and being, you know, I mentioned before the Falun Gong, being afraid of a breathing sect. I mean, being afraid of Taiwanese democracy. The U.S. can compete. You know, we're still far wealthier. Um, you know, we we have our domestic divisions, but we have a legitimate political system. And there's a lot of ways that we can compete. It's just a decision, and this sort of goes back to the Biden administration and Taiwan today and the Pelosi visit, a decision that we have to take some risks in order to compete. And if you do so effectively, you know, they'll, they'll back off. And that's what you want them to do. Yeah. Well, it's a good place to end. Maybe, uh, maybe on an optimistic note, things won't be so bad. Maybe this problem will resolve itself because uh, the Chinese suck. <laughs> see, see how that goes for we us. Got, we got to do some things, but yeah. Yeah, no, we definitely do. And I think we laid out some uh, pretty obvious options. And uh, frankly, you know, especially on the, the Taiwan relations and and delivering those arms as fast as possible. There's a lot of members of Congress, bipartisan, constantly pushing for this. This administration seems to be very dovish on China in a way that not even Democrats in the House and, and Senate are. So I don't understand it. Um, but you know, I th- maybe they're just afraid of Joe Biden being a, uh, a conflict-oriented president because they're not sure he can handle it, which perhaps they're right about. But that remains to be seen. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep pushing for what's right. Well, good. I mean, right now, getting arms to Taiwan and, and showing support is is just key as China tries to undermine the status quo. Well, Dan, thanks. Uh, thanks for your expertise and 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 work on this over the years. And uh, what, what was the book again? The China Nightmare, the Grand Ambitions of a Decaying State. Very good. Very good. All right, Dan, thanks so much for being on. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure.